The Holy Grail of Shakespeare Scholarship, an original manuscript of a Shakespeare play corrected in the hand of its secret concealed author, Francis Bacon. It is identified and revealed here for the first time that the little known so-called Daring manuscript of Henry IV, the unique and earliest known extant manuscript of a Shakespeare play, does not, as previously believed, date from 1613 to 23, but is in fact an authorial manuscript dating from around 1596, originating out of Bacon's literary workshop and corrected in his own hand. All the separate editions of 1 Henry IV and 2 Henry IV share a common factor. Namely, they do not discuss Bacon in any of their lengthy and otherwise detailed introductions. In fact, they scarcely mention or refer to Bacon at all. It is the popular Arden edition of King Henry IV Part I, first published in 2002, which lays claim to the distinction of being the first of these standard editions to include an entry for Bacon Francis, which refers to a textual comparison with his advancement of learning. In what appears to be either the ignorance or the systematic silence and suppression of these editors, is it any wonder that the ordinary schoolman, the casual student and the rest of the world at large are unfamiliar with the critical and extensive links between its secret concealed author Bacon and 1 Henry IV and 2 Henry IV and the so-called Daring Manuscript, which is a single play version of what is now seen as parts one and parts two of Henry IV. This unique manuscript is the earliest known of a shape Play. It is widely believed that 1 Henry IV, in the form that it is printed, was written in late 1595 or early 1596, although some have dated it as early as 1593. It was first entered in the Stationers' Register on the 25th of February 1598 as the History of Henry IV, the title used for its first surviving quarter edition printed by Peter Short for the publisher Andrew Wise in 1598. The date to Henry IV was written has never been precisely determined. It is generally believed to have been written between 1596 and 1599. It was entered in the Stationers' Register on the 23rd of August 1600 as the second part of Henry IV, and shortly after it appeared late, th late that year with the same title in a quarter edition printed by Valentine Sims for Andrew Wise and William Apsley. No other quarto edition of the play appeared before it was published in revised form in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. It is simply astonishing just how often Bacon refers and alludes to himself in Henry IV, and likewise members of the Bacon family who are either directly referred to by name or act as models or inspiration for a number of the characters in the play. Professor Alice Lyle Scoofer states, in the earliest quartos of 1 Henry IV, one of the characters is named Russell, who was one of Falstaff's crew who planned and carried out the Gads Hill robbery, a send-up of Sir John Russell. Very little is known about Sir John Russell, but there is one salient fact in the paucity of available biographical details that all Shakespeare editors, including the single editors of 1 Henry IV, collectively failed to mention. Namely, John Lord Russell was the uncle of Francis Bacon. Lord Russell was the son of Francis Russell, 2nd Earl of Bedford, part of a Bedford dynasty whose private and political relationship with the Bacons stretched back to the reign of Henry VIII. Francis Russell, 2nd Earl of Bedford, was a close ally of Sir Nicholas Bacon and godfather to Francis Bacon, for whom he secured the seats of Bossingway Cornwall in 1581 and Weymouth and Malcolm Regis in 1584. On the 23rd of December 1574, his son Sir John Russell married Lady Anne Cook Bacon's sister, Elizabeth Cook Hobie. The union lasted 10 years before Sir John Russell died in 1584 and his wife remained a widow for the rest of her days.
His widow, Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie Russell, was an intelligent, combative and verbose woman and possessed the unenviable habit of interfering in everybody's business, including the members of her own family. The Orthodox Shakespeare scholar, Professor Scoofos, correctly suggested that Lady Bacon's younger sister, Lady Russell, may have been the inspiration for the wonderful creation of Mistress Quickly. It is tempting to see in this historical episode a fang and snare exion with Falstaff and Mistress Quickly heading towards litigation. Could Lady Russell's overbearing mannerisms, her pretentious intellection, her colourful and eclectic vocabulary have had an important bearing on the creation of that wondrous and voluble character, Mistress Quickly? In Act 5, Scene 1 of 2 Henry IV, on his way back from his campaign, Sir John Falstaff and Bardolph arrive at Robert Shallow's house, a Gloucestershire Justice of the Peace, who, with the help of his steward Davy, prepares to entertain Falstaff and Bardolph with a dinner. When Shallow refers to his cook, he is called William Cook, just as Bacon's uncle John, Lord Russell, was one of Falstaff's original followers, and his wife, Bacon's aunt, Lady Cook Hobie Russell, the inspiration for Mistress Quickly. The cook named William Cook in Henry IV is named after Bacon's cousin, William Cook of Hynham Court in Gloucestershire. Bacon not only lampooned and sent up his uncle and aunt, Lord John and Lady Elizabeth Russell, and amusingly played on the name of his, his cousin William Cook, he also pointedly alludes to his father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, and humorously sends himself up as the draw named Francis. In the first act of 1 Henry IV, Prince Hal is exchanging witty banter with Sir John Falstaff when Poins invites them along with their confederates to take part in a robbery planned for the following morning at Gad's Hill. In the scene, one of the carriers says, I have a gammon of bacon and two races of ginger to be delivered as far as Charing Cross, a pun on the name of bacon. As the scene develops, Gad's Hill, in an exchange with the Chamberlain, says, Sirrah, if they meet not with St. Nicholas's clerks, I'll give thee this neck. To which the Chamberlain replies, No, I'll none of it. I pray thee keep that for the hangman, for I know thou worshippest St. Nicholas as truly as a man of falsehood may. Nicholas is, of course, the Christian name of Bacon's father, Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon. The passage alludes to a story later recalled by Francis in his Apothegms, relating to a case presided over by Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon. Prithee, said my Lord Judge, how came that in? Why, if it please you, my Lord, your name is Bacon, and mine is Hogg, and in all ages Hogg and Bacon have been so near kindred that they are not to be separated. I but replied Judge Bacon, you and I cannot be kindred, except you be hanged, for hog is not bacon until it be well hanged. The above episode relating to Sir Nicholas, Nicholas Bacon is also succinctly alluded to in The Merry Wives of Windsor, when Mistress Quickly, a character partly modelled upon Lady Bacon's younger sister, Lady Cook Hobie Russell, exclaimed, Hang hog is Latin for bacon, I warrant you. As arranged, Falstaff, Prince Hal, Poins, aided by Gadshill, Harvey and Russell, gather to attack the hapless travellers and relieve them of their bounty. As the robbery begins to unfold, Falstaff cries out, Strike down with them, cut the villains' throats, ah, horse and caterpillars, bacon-fed knaves, they hate us youth, down with them, fleece them. Hang ye gore-bellied knaves, are ye undone, know ye fat chuffs, I would your store were here. On bacons, on, what ye knaves, young men must live, you are grand jurors, are ye? We'll jewel ye faith. Again, plain on the name Bacon. Back at the Boar's Head Inn in the East Cheap, Hal is fraternising with the bar staff, and he and Poins perplex the drawer Francis before the other ro robbers arrive. In his speech, Prince Hal sets the scene. Sirrah, I am sworn brother to a leash of drawers, and can call them all by their Christian names as Tom, Dick and Francis. To while away the hour, Hal invites Poins to play a witty joke on the barm and Francis to confuse and disorientate him. 
In the first folio in the history section on page 56, which is F.R. Bacon in Simple Cipher, the following exchange between Hal Poins and the barman Francis is very carefully and deliberately arranged in a single column for a very specific purpose, where the Christian name Francis is repeated 33 times, the number representing Bacon in Simple Cipher. More allusions to Bacon abound in the plays. In Act 4, Scene 2 of 1 Henry 4, Falstaff and Sir John Russell, with their company, march through the Midlands toward Shrewsbury. The scene is mainly taken up with a long speech by Falstaff complaining that his bedraggled company have but a shirt and half between them, containing a needless reference to St Albans. There's not a shirt and a half in all my company, and the half shirt is two napkins tacked together and thrown over the shoulders like a herald's coat without sleeves. And the shirt, to say the truth, stolen from my host at St Albans, or the red-nosed innkeeper of Daventry, but that's all one. They'll find linen enough on every hedge. What appears to be another unnecessary reference to St Albans is found in 2 Henry IV. I warrant you, as common as the way between St Albans and London. The Bacon family country seat was situated at Gorhambury, St Albans. In 1 Henry IV, Bacon even, even thoughtfully left one of his secret signatures in the form of the following anagram. In Act Two, Mistress Quickly, Lady Russell, hostess of the Boar's Head Tavern, or is that the Bacon's Head Tavern, arranges for the officer's fang and snare to arrest Falstaff for debt, but he manages to wheedle another loan from her along with a promise of dinner. In an exchange with Falstaff, the wonderful character of the night, Dol Tearsheet, in unfolding her colourful mind, utters another allusion to the name Bacon. If faith and thou followedst him like a church, thou horse and little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. Falstaff calls for more of his favourite sustenance, some sack, Francis, providing us with the name of its concealed author, Francis Bacon. The scene is broken by a violent knock at the door, and Mistress quickly shouts, Who knocks so loud at door? More commotion is heard outside, and Mistress Quickly, Lady Russell, shouts to her nephew, the great philosopher-poet, pricelessly disguised as a dull-witted barman, Look to the door there, Francis. It may well have been a scene of a Bacon family gathering at Gorhambury, or maybe one down the local in St Albans at the White Hart Inn on the edge of the Bacon family estate. The 15th century White Hart Inn in St Albans, believed to have been a 16th, 17th century Rosicrucian lodge, contains a surviving mural dating from the late 16th century showing the death of Adonis killed by a boar from Bacon's Shakespeare narrative poem, Venus and Adonis. In addition to the references and allusions to firstly himself as Francis the Draw, his aunt Lady Elizabeth Cook Hoby Russell, Mistress Quickly, younger sister of his mother Lady Anne Cook Bacon, and her second husband, John Lord Russell, Sir John Russell, a member of, a member of Falstaff's motley crew, his cousin William Cook of Hynham Court in Gloucestershire, the chef William Cook, and the anagrammatic signature spelling out his name F. Bacon, the title pages of the quarto editions of 1 Henry IV and 2 Henry IV contain a number of Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. Above the first page of the 1600 quarter edition of 2 Henry IV appears the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece, and the same headpiece appears over the page of the 1604 edition of 1 Henry IV. Across the top of the page headed actors' names in the 1623 Shakespeare first folio for 2 Henry IV appears another Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece, which is of a different design. As we have seen, one of the characters in 1 Henry IV is named Francis the Draw, the Christian name of Francis Bacon, that is, one who draws alcohol to serve the customers at the boar's head. 
A boar is a wild pig and bacon is taken from the back or side of a pig, thus giving us Francis Bacon, the character who is also mocked in 2 Henry 4. In 2 Henry 4, the same Christian name is also given to Francis Feeble, a woman's tailor, who is mocked with the stereotype of effeminacy and sexual deviance, an allusion to Bacon's sexuality. One of the men levied along with Peter Bullcalf to fight for King Henry IV. Now, if we look closely at the page of the actor's name above which stands Bacon's double-A headpiece, the last two entries at the bottom page read Feeble and Bullcalf, beginning with the letters F and B, which double up for Francis Bacon. In the 1623 first folio, part of this passage is so formatted that if we read down from the capital F in Francis, the Christian name of Francis Bacon, follow, following the indented lines, the next line down begins with the capital letter B, the initial of Bacon, providing us with the initials of Francis Bacon. Before we turn our attention to the earliest known manuscript of a Shakespeare play, it is necessary to turn to the history of its transmission to the present day. The manuscript is, according to modern scholarship, a handwritten abridgment of 1 and 2 Henry IV, most, mostly written in the hand of a 17th century scribe with numerous emendations and revisions by Sir Edward Dering for a private performance at his house in Kent around 1623. The manuscript is supposedly based on the 1613 quarto edition of 1 Henry IV and 1600 quarto edition of 2 Henry IV and must therefore date from at least 1613 and on the basis of an accompanying scrap of paper containing an acting list for the Spanish curate it is most likely dated between 1622 and 1624. The so-called Dering Manuscript was discovered on the 23rd of October 1844 by the Reverend Lambert B. Larking while he was examining the charters and manuscripts preserved in the collection of Sir Edward Dering at Surrenden Hall. He immediately communicated news of the discovery to Shakespearean scholars and in 1845 the Shakespeare Society printed the full text with annotations and an introduction by James Orchard Halliwell. This, as with other publications by the Shakespeare Society, was only available through subscription to a very small number of its society members. Halliwell states that the manuscript has been corrected in many places by a later hand, which has been distinctly ascertained by careful comparisons made by Mr Larking to have been the work of Sir Edward Dering. The corrections made by Sir E. Dering are for the most part restorations to the printed text as it is found in the editions of the day, and in one place he has added a marginal note, Vide Printed Book, clearly showing that he had collated parts of the manuscript with a printed copy then in his hands. In support of this assertion, Halliwell provides facsimiles of a portion of the first page of the manuscript handwriting in the presumed hand of Dering from the manuscript, and a specimen of Dering's handwriting apparently taken from a manuscript in the family archives. The only problem is the handwriting in the presumed hand of Dering and the specimen of Dering's handwriting bears little obvious similarities. A series of Shakespeare scholars also give different and conflicting opinions on the handwriting in the so-called Dering Manuscript. A correspondent to Notes and Queries who signs himself SYE wrote, I think it could be held with much greater certainty that the manuscript and the corrections are in the same hand, the corrections having been written more hastily and more carelessly by way of a disguise. S.B. Hemingway also expressed an altogether different view. The first page of the manuscript is written in a clear, flowing and unprofessional hand, the remainder in a more cramped but more professional hand. And following Derrin's acquisition of the manuscript after 1622, many marginal corrections and emendations in his Derrin's hand. Or alternatively, according to G. Blakemore Evans, it appears that the first page not only bears revisions in the hand of Sir Edward Derrin, but is copied as a whole by Sir Edward Derrin.
before adding that the rest of the manuscript written in a different hand. At some unknown date, Halliwell purchased the so-called Derring manuscript for his own collection, and some years later sold it to George Guy Greville, the 4th Earl of Warwick, probably during the 1860s, when he was assisting the Earl in assembling the collection at Warwick Castle. Following the dispersal of this collection after the Earl's death, the manuscript was acquired in 1897 by Henry Clay Folger, from which time it disappeared from view, locked away in a secret vault for 70 years. It now resides in the Folger Shakespeare Library, a secret Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic institution. Finally, after Halliwell first printed the text in 1845, the manuscript was reproduced in facsimile for the first time 129 years later by the Folger Shakespeare Library, under the joint editorship of George Walton Williams and Gwynne Blakemore Evans in 1974. The facsimile is reproduced alongside a page-by-page -page transcription. For reasons best known to the joint editors themselves, no facsimiles of Dering's handwriting are reproduced. Instead, they preferred the assertion of words to actual evidence and repeat the assertion that the MS is derived from the fifth quarto of 1 Henry IV, printed in 1613, and the second issue of 2 Henry IV in 1600. For his group of friends, write Williams and Evans, it would seem that Dering proposed in 1622 or thereafter a production of an abridged version of Henry IV. However, as we will see, he never completed his correction of the manuscript or prepared it finally for use in a dramatic performance. On examining Derring's book of household expenses for the years 1617 to 1627, which is known to have been extant since 1845, Letitia Yandel, the curator of manuscripts at the Folger Shakespeare Library, made known for the first time the entry for the 27th of February 1623, apparently referring to the so-called Derring manuscript. The entry is reproduced by Yandel in a facsimile of the Derring entry with the following transcription. Paid Mr. Carrington for writing out ye play of King Henry IV. To be clear, this is not for the so-called Derrin manuscript, but it would appear the entry refers to a payment for Carrington to make a copy of it. The actual so-called Derrin manuscript, the one here under discussion, directly or indirectly derived from its author Derrin's close friend and relative Francis Bacon. In a footnote, Williams and Evans are compelled to point out that the five acts in the so-called Derring manuscript version is consistent with the hypothetical reconstruction by Harold Jenkins of Henry IV, who maintained Shakespeare originally intended to write only one five-act play, and in the course of writing, it changed his mind and decided to write two plays on the same reign. The possibility Shakespeare originally intended to write one only play on the reign of Henry IV has also occurred to other editors, including P. H. Davison, editor of the recent edition of One Henry IV. We do not know whether, when writing One Henry IV, Shakespeare had a second part in mind. It is possible he intended to write only one play on this reign, but found he had too much material for a single play and thus began to prepare for a second part. In contrast to Williams and Evans and some of the other Shakespeare scholars, another orthodox scholar, Professor Harding Craig, examined the manuscript in 1956 and observed the Derring version contains a number of differences and peculiarities which remain unchanged by any contact with the 5th 1613 quarto of 1 Henry IV. He further observes it was written in a normal Elizabethan hand, with no discernible Jacobean intermixtures, and most importantly concludes it may be older than the earliest 1598 quarto edition of 1 Henry IV, 
and that it is a manuscript of Shakespeare's play when it was originally one and not two plays. In his later work, A New Look at Shakespeare's Quartos, Professor Craig emphatically states that the theory that the so-called Daring Manuscript was based on the 1613 Quarto of 1 Henry IV and the 1600 Quarto of 2 Henry IV is stupid, absurd and impossible. It is incredible that any scholar who has had to do with 1 Henry IV and especially 2 Henry IV and who has read the Derring play could fail to see evidence that the Derring play is a single drama antedating the two-part play and represents as it stands Shakespeare's original treatment of the wildlife of Prince Hal, his reformation, his winning of glory and his rejection of Falstaff. Of course, these things could not be if the Daring version was based, as it was thought to be, on the fifth quarto of 1 Henry IV, a notion which is impossible, besides being stupid and unnecessary. For obvious and some less obvious reasons, this longer study by Professor Craig is completely ignored and suppressed by Evans and Williams in their facsimile edition of the Daring Manuscript of Henry IV, which has entirely misled orthodox Shakespeare scholarship for the last 50 years, because Craig's thorough examination and analysis utterly confutes and demolishes the fraudulent theory that the Daring Manuscript is based upon the printed quartos of the play. More recently, the so-called Daring Manuscript has received another detailed examination and critical evaluation by John Baker, in which he purports to show that the bibliographical, paleographic and literary evidence, as first put forward by Professor Craig, favours the early pre-publication date of around 1596 for the writing of the manuscript just prior to the first quarter of 1 Henry IV in 1598. Sir Edward Dering was not even born in 1596. His dates are 1598 to 1644. The nature of the manuscript, Baker incisively observes, implies that the author was a scholar who operated a scriptorium, wherein he and his staff methodically proofread and revised his works. He was not aware of how close he was to the truth. In the 1590s, Francis and Anthony Bacon set up a scriptorium or literary workshop, employing writers, translators, scribes and copyists for the distribution of private manuscripts, plays, masks and other dramatic entertainments. In a letter from Francis to Anthony, dated from the 25th of January 1594, he says, I have an idle pen or two. I pray send me somewhat else for them to write out besides your Irish collection, which is almost done. Not long before the Henry IV manuscript by Bacon originated out of the same literary workshop. The evidence, Baker states, is conclusive that the so-called Derrin manuscript was not transcribed from printed materials and can only be an authorial fair copy of Henry IV. Prior to him editing the so-called Daring Manuscript, Gwyn Blakemore Evans had a secret life which brought him into regular and close contact with William Friedman. During and after the Second World War, Friedman, the greatest cryptologist of the 20th century, was working at the very pinnacle of top secret US intelligence, which involved frequent contact with British intelligence at GCHQ, MI5 and MI6, and visits to Bletchley Park in Buckinghamshire, home to the top secret country estate run by MI6, housing brilliant mathematicians and cryptologists, cipher and code breakers, to break the enigma and other secret German communications. During the Second World War, Gwyn Blakemore Evans also worked for US intelligence serving in the Army Signal Corps codes and ciphers, at Bletchley Park, working on top secret code and cipher communications. When the Second World War ended, it seems someone commissioned or encouraged the Freedmans to return to the subject which had formed part of their lives since before the First World War, namely the Baconian authorship of the Shakespeare plays. 
the Freedmans were keepers of secrets. One of those secrets was Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare works, which the Freedmans fraudulently and falsely refuted in the Shakespearean ciphers examined, actively aided by very senior members of the Folger Shakespeare Library, a secret Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic institution that still maintains the secrecy surrounding Bacon and his immortal Shakespeare plays. In the words of Professor Henrion of French Cipher Intelligence, the Shakespearean ciphers examined by the Freedmans was nothing more than a command performance whose so-called scientific demonstrations the Freedmans knew to be false. A work described by Kenneth R. Patton as probably one of the most deceitful books ever written. The frankly shocking ledger domain of the Freedmans, who unquestionably knew exactly what they were doing, stooped to the very lowest kind of intellectual dishonesty. In truth, this book is probably the most astonishing collection of deceit and deliberately calculated falsifications that have ever been crammed between the covers of a book. I can only believe that some person or organisation with a vested interest in the perpetuation of the Stratfordian myth commissioned the Freedmans to write it. Unknown to history, the Bacon family had a close personal relationship with the Derings, which stretched stretch back decades. Edward Derring's great uncle, also called Ed, Edward Derring, was a controversial and learned Church of England clergyman and Puritan. Lady Anne and Sir Nicholas Bacon were closely connected with him, and Lady Anne was his patron. His great nephew, Edward Derrin, destined to be linked to the first Shakespeare manuscript ever discovered, married the granddaughter of William Cecil, Francis Bacon's uncle. There are no mentions of links between Edward Derring and Francis Bacon in the ODMBs and previous D DNBs or in Bacon's biographical canon. These links have been systematically suppressed and withheld from the world, primarily on account of the unique so-called Derry manuscript of Henry IV, the earliest known manuscript of a Shakespeare play, and the secrets it holds and its implications for the authorship of the Shakespeare works. The whole illusory house of cards of the so-called Derring manuscript rests entirely on the presence of Derring's hand in the manuscript. If his hand is not present, Derring self-evidently had nothing whatsoever to do with its composition, abridgment, revision, cuts, its division into acts and scenes, its numerous editions of 50 lines, 50 and a half lines, the introduction of original material in prose and verse, or its wholesale and extensive corrections. The large, formatted edition of the so-called Derring Manuscript by Blakemore Evans and George Walton Williams, published for the Folger Shakespeare Library, totals 238 pages, comprising an introduction, a note on the transcription and textual notes, the names of all the characters, a facsimile and transcription with textual notes of the manuscript itself, and a descriptive and historical collation. It also includes a facsimile of the accompanying scrap of paper, obverse and, re and reverse, with a transcription of the obverse and of the eight lines on the reverse incorporated into page one of the text. There is only one absolutely critical piece of evidence missing, namely a facsimile of Derring's handwriting. There is no reasonable or rational explanation whatsoever why Evans and Williams did not reproduce what constitutes the most important evidence in their whole daring theory. By now, the intelligent and alert reader will probably strongly suspect or more likely readily realise there is something wrong, something very, very wrong, when the modern authorities on the Derring manuscript have unmistakably and very deliberately not reproduced facsimiles of Derring's handwriting in this standard edition of the so-called Derring manuscript. What was it then they apparently wanted to conceal from other ordinary scholars and the rest of the Shakespearean world? Simple. The hand of Derring is nowhere present in the so-called Derring manuscript, a very simple fact which at a stroke completely and incontrovertibly exposes and demolishes this whole charade and irrefutably demolishes a fraud or illusion, secretly known to some for more than a century, once and for all.
Unlike with the Folger published work by Evans and Williams, it is not necessary for the reader to take this on trust, and unlike Evans and Williams, Daring's hand will be reproduced. Firstly, two facsimiles produced by Halliwell in 1845, facsimile of Sir E. Daring's handwriting from a manuscript in the archives of the family, and allegedly his handwriting from the Shakespeare manuscript. The hand in the first of these facsimiles bears no similarity to the hand in the so-called Dering manuscript. Secondly, the facsimile from the first page of the Dering manuscript reproduced in the same edition containing corrections which Halliwell supposed were in the same hand as the above. Thirdly, in order that we can be very certain Dering's handwriting is not present in the manuscript, reproduced are two full page facsimiles of his handwriting from his own book of expenses. Fourthly, a facsimile of the whole of page one and two of the so-called Dering manuscript. And finally, facsimiles of the obverse and reverse of the scrap of paper containing the acting list on the one side and the eight additional lines of text on the other. The undoubted examples of Dering's hand in his household book of expenses bears no resemblance whatsoever to the handwriting, including its corrections, in the first and second pages of the so-called Dering manuscript, or the handwriting in the obverse and reverse of the scrap of paper. In fact, not only is it manifestly plain that Dering's hand in his book of expenses and the hands in the so-called Dering manuscript do not even remotely resemble each other, it would be difficult to conceive of any other specimen handwriting examples being more different. What then is the reason for the fraud and the false insistence on Dering's handwriting being present in the so-called Dering manuscript? The reason is because it masks and conceals its true status, provenance and date. In other words, it misdirects the eye away from a great historical secret, one known to some since it was first discovered and others who were made privy to the secret afterwards. There are three hands in the manuscript of Henry IV, two of which were scribes. It appears the manuscript was copied from another manuscript now lost. The so-called Dering manuscript was begun by one scribe who copied out the whole of page one and for some unknown and likely unrecoverable reason, after the scribe had completed the first page, the task was turned over to a second scribe who copied out the rest of the manuscript. The Dering manuscript is intimately connected to the literary workshop comprising writers, scribes and clerks which produced Bacon's Northumberland manuscript, which once contained his Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III, dating from around 1596. On the outside cover of the Northumberland manuscript, in a contemporary hand, there are more than a dozen examples in various forms of the names Baco, Bacon, Francis Bacon and Shakespeare or William Shakespeare. Above the entry for the Shakespeare play Richard II is written by Mr Francis William Shakespeare and where the name William Shakespeare has been written further down the page, the word your is written twice across it so thus reads your William Shakespeare on the outer cover of Bacon's collection of manuscripts by one of the scribes he employed. The writing on the outer cover of the manuscript is chiefly in one hand, with occasional words in another, and a few words written at angle, possibly by a third. One of the hands was undoubtedly Bacon, who was also responsible for the monogram signature WS at the top right hand corner. The main content of Bacon's Northumberland manuscript is written in two or more hands and like the so-called Dering manuscript, one of these works, known as Leicester's Commonwealth, is written by two different penmen, whose identity remains unknown. It appears one of the two scribes who copied out Leicester's Commonwealth in the Northumberland manuscript was also responsible for copying out the so-called Dering manuscript from the second page onwards. The so-called corrector's hand in the same manuscript responsible for its revisions and corrections and its authorial editions are written in Bacon's cramped hand, as one would expect from the author of the play.
The reverse of the scrap of paper containing the eight additional lines appears to be written in a different hand to any present in the so-called Dering manuscript, and the hand in the obverse appears different to the hand in the reverse and the other hands in the manuscript itself, and may possibly be from other unidentified scribes that had also been employed in Bacon's literary workshop. The so-called Dering Manuscript is a single five-act Shakespeare play on Henry IV and is earlier than the first printed quarto of the History of Henry IV issued in 1598 and quarto edition of the second part of Henry IV printed in 1600. The manuscript represents the play as Bacon originally composed it when it was one play and not two before developing his original version into two separate parts. We can be reasonably precise regarding the date of the manuscript. It is widely agreed Henry IV followed closely upon Richard II, as not only is Henry IV next chronologically, its predecessor Richard II clearly points to a sequel. The earlier Richard II is believed to date to around late 1595 or early 1596, and Henry IV was probably composed sometime in 1596. At least one of the scribes from the same literary workshop responsible for parts of the Northumberland manuscript, originally containing its predecessor Richard II, was likely working from Bacon's original manuscript of Henry IV. Perhaps it is now more than fitting that instead of it being referred to as the Dering manuscript, it is hereafter known by its right and proper designation as Francis Bacon's manuscript of Henry IV, the unique and earliest known extant manuscript of a Shakespeare play. In 1988, a second unique manuscript dating from around 400 years ago briefly emerged from the shadows, which should, like Bacon's so-called Dering manuscript, be known to all serious Shakespeare scholars and throughout the rest of the learned world. The reason this is not the case will soon become only all too apparent. The two-page Tapster manuscript comprises a single leaf of paper, which on its recto and verso are 57 lines of blank verse dialogue. The dialogue is conducted by three characters, a Tapster and two thieves. The scene is laid in an inn outside of London in some unidentified location. It begins with the Tapster telling the thieves there is a man lodged in the house with 300 marks in gold, who carries it to the King's Exchequer received for re recently forfeited lands. The man is travelling alone without any security through the countryside, where he tells them they can rob him of his large booty. And this is a transcription of the Tapster manuscript. It will be immediately clear to all Shakespeare scholars and students that the above is similar to the robbery at Gads Hill in 1 Henry IV. The manuscript is undated and, writes Arthur Freeman, the first and only orthodox scholar to have closely looked at it, save for its literary relationship with 1 Henry IV, there is little evidence to establish the date of the Tapster manuscript or to suggest its origin. The manuscript leaf was discovered in a copy of Homer's Odyssey published at Geneva in 1586. Its binding is English and most probably from an Oxford workshop with Freeman and Preserving. The style is too clearly generic to suggest a date range narrower than 1586 through about 1620. With the manuscript leaf undoubtedly related to Henry IV, the question is, is it a predecessor, even a source, or a descendant of such a predecessor, or an adaptation? He tentatively says, I would place the Tapster manuscript among contemporary Shakespearean analogues, more likely to follow than precede Shakespeare's text. And on the basis of no evidence, the most economical guess may be 1600 to 20. Closing with, the possibility of direct or indirect transmission from a pre-Shakespearean version of 1 Henry IV should not be dismissed. 
The Shoyan collection, which now holds the Tapster manuscript, where it is described as the Shakespeare leaf, assigns a date for its ranging from 1586 to 1600. It is clear from the text itself that the Tapster manuscript predates the writing and publication of 1 Henry IV. In his article, Freeman further compared the handwriting in the Tapster manuscript, a good fluent full secretary, to a large number of English literary hands of the period, including, I think, every named professional dramatist whose penmanship survives, and nearly all playhouse scripts, many in multiple hands, without finding a credible match. His criteria of known professional dramatist presumably excludes Bacon, and he does not specifically tell us whether he compared the Tapster manuscript to a sample of Bacon's known handwriting. This would appear to be very curious, because Freeman concludes his article by referring to the fact the handwriting in the Tapster manuscript had been compared to Bacon's known handwriting by professional handwriting experts, who indicated in the affirmative that they were one and the same. In July 1992, the world-renowned Sotheby's offered the Tapster manuscript for sale, which their experts described as a manuscript of the same date and bearing a striking similarity to a scene from Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part I. In placing a sample of the handwriting in the Tapster manuscript alongside a letter in Bacon's hand from 1595, its advertisement states, Two graphologists have confirmed that both the play scene fragment and the letter are probably written by the same person. In 1992, the Baconian scholar and author Francis Carr, director of the Shakespeare Authorship Information Centre, submitted the Tapster manuscript for examination to the internationally renowned forensic handwriting expert Maureen Ward Gandhi, accredited by the Law Society and frequently used by US and UK law enforcement and government agencies. In her detailed 25-page report dated July 1992, Gandhi compared the writing in the Tapster manuscript to some 30, 30 17th century writers and the known handwriting of Francis Bacon. She concluded it was of likelihood of common authorship between the known by Francis Bacon and the disputed script is of high probability. In other words, the Henry IV fragment was almost certainly written in the hand of Francis Bacon. The identification of the authorial manuscript of Henry IV, corrected in the hand of its author Francis Bacon, represents the most important discovery in the history of Bacon Shakespeare scholarship, which confirms that Francis Bacon is Shakespeare. This is the holy grail of Shakespeare scholarship, an original manuscript of a Shakespeare play corrected in the hand of its secret concealed author, Francis Bacon.